but he was really special because okay. he, I could tell Hello, and, uh, he was always on. Hello, and Facebook is ready to begin the class. Uh, like uh, this. <laughs> just another minute or two, uh, but we welcome you here. Uh, this class is going to be on, and uh, good to have you back. So, uh, uh, apologize for last week. Uh, I'd like to point the finger at somebody else, but uh, it's hard to do since I was the class lead. So I can't find anybody that will take the blame for not being on Facebook last week. So uh, I'm the culprit. So uh, going to be another interesting discussion and um, really look forward to the discussion. It's, I think you're going to see some surprising wrinkles. So uh, let me open us in prayer. And um, if... Um, if, if uh, you could send a signal some way or whether or not you can hear me, uh, let me know. I don't have a microphone tonight, and I will try to uh, speak up for you. So we have a group here and a group on Facebook. Uh, so let me open us in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we're just so uh, grateful and thankful that uh, you bring us together again as a Christian brothers and sisters uh, to explore your revelation and your word and to particularly explore how uh, we can live like Jesus and uh, reflect uh, this, um, this compassion and this concern and this uh, relationship with, uh, with our Lord. Uh, you lead us, you show us that. And we're grateful for that. And... Um, you shower us with untold riches that uh, the world just does not understand. They do not understand the riches that you shower us with and you bless us with those. So be with us tonight. Keep our hearts open to uh, uh, your word, your leadership, your counsel, your relationship. Amen. Well, I got to tell you about... Uh, Renee and I had an extraordinary afternoon. Uh, we were up at Coyote Ridge all afternoon. Coyote Ridge is a correction center, and uh, we do two classes up there. And today was uh, God's story, your story. <laughs> had a great turnout. But something special was happening. It was, these classes are always, always excellent. But this one was just um, Hard to describe. Uh, I mean, it was spiritual depth, spiritual maturity, uh, relationship building, transparency, honesty. Um, the guys that say we came clean, you know, we, we just told it like it is and uh, shared ourselves in our life. And they took a lot of risk uh, by being so transparent and uh, more so than you would you know, in life, but I just want to share that with you, how special that was today, and what a blessing it was for Renee and I. Um, man, these these men are just our Christian friends, and uh, I just want to let you know what a wonderful day we had. Uh, it was really special. So we're continuing to move along in uh, living like Jesus, and you know, I, I, keep, I keep saying, the Sermon on the Mount, if, if you want a manual on how to live like Jesus, uh, just go to the Sermon on the Mount. That is the manual on living like Jesus. And I'm going to share with you a, uh, another man who wrote a book that's probably the second read second largest read book in history outside of the Bible. And I'll share a little bit about something he wrote about this whole area a few hundred years ago. So the theme tonight, the subject is how to spot a false prophet. And you might say, well, boy, that's really timely. Uh, we have false prophets and uh, deceit going on right now. And um, 
The context, of course, is how to spot a uh, false prophet in the faith, but a lot of what we're going to talk about is how to test uh, the integrity and the integrity of a word of somebody, even in uh, the secular world. So let's get right to it. Uh, I'm, I think you're going to find it uh, enjoyable. So <clears throat> how to spot a false prophet is covered in Matthew 7, 15 through 23. So let me first read this uh, scripture real quick. And then we'll come back and take a look at it in a little more detail. Watch out for the false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I'll tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. This is, a, actually there's nine verses here and it's really interesting when you start expanding them and looking at how it's structured. Um, so let's first explore Matthew 7, 15 through 23. You know, now you can make, uh, you, can, you can take this, these nine scriptures and break that up into three major themes. The first theme is Matthew 7, 15, the first verse. False prophets. The second major theme is Matthew 7, 16 through 20, which is a metaphor to bridge us from false prophets to the last theme, Matthew 7, 21 through 23, which is really about false followers. So we have false prophets, the transition metaphor, and then false followers. <clears throat> so let's look at uh, 7, 15. So why would Jesus start on false prophets. Um, well, I remember 2,000 years ago, and uh, the followers, uh, you know, this was just a building faith. And uh, he, he knew he, was, he was wanted to build this community of followers for a very, very, very long period of time. And so part of his training for them was how to recognize truth from false. And um, this wasn't a new issue, false prophets in Jesus' time, because the Old Testament is steeped with false prophets and earlier false prophets. And uh, uh, Jesus knew from the Old Testament that uh, the people would infiltrate not just that community, but his community. Uh, so he had these examples from, uh, from uh, the Old Testament. For example, Jeremiah 13, 15. Uh, Jesus had evidence of false prophets from that. From the least to the greatest, all are greedy for gain. Prophets and priests alike all practice deceit. They dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. Are they ashamed of their detestable conduct? No, they have no shame at all. They do not even know how to blush. So they will fall among the fallen. They will be brought down when I punish them, says the Lord. And that's Jeremiah 6, 13 through 15. So you see, the false, and there's so many other examples in the Old Testament of false prophets invading God's community. Um, 
you know, you had the false religions, but uh, within Judaism, there were the Israelites, there were false prophets. Uh, so Jesus was telling uh, his people then, not all prophets are true. They aren't true. You have to learn how to discern and evaluate what they say. Because uh, they're going to come across as real, the real deal, you know. Um, so he's, he's saying our enemies, um, they're going to try to conceal their deceit. They're going to try to conceal their faults. They're going to make it look, you know, this, this isn't a, a counterfeit. They're going to do everything they can to make you believe that they were a follower of Jesus. Uh, so, uh, you know, Sin, he knew from the Old Testament, they're going to use our Orthodox language. They're going to use, or they're going to speak the words we speak. They can memorize them. And uh, their orators are really good at this stuff. And uh, they're going to show biblical piety and how pious we are. And, you know, we love God. Look how we tithe. And look how we teach. And look at this and look at that. And uh, from what they say, and even what they do, you may not be able to tell them from the true prophets. They, they can be that good. And uh, we have to know how to distinguish the sheep from the wolves. Because uh, you know, the wolves are going to look like sheep. But on the inside, uh, you know, it's, it, it's a different animal. Yeah. Now the other, the other point here is now Jesus is making a, an assertion that, uh, look, uh, I, can, uh, I know what a false prophet is because I'm the true prophet. I'm the one you should, therefore, and so I think what the Pharisees are saying, well, wait a minute, what, maybe he's the false prophet. So he's saying he can identify false prophets. Um, we don't know what the false prophets at this point were saying or doing. But from the context and from the fact that it, Jesus took time to share that in the Sermon on the Mount, the false prophets were there. They were starting to assemble against Jesus. He wanted to defend his ministry from them. So uh, his key point is a false prophet will not show you the narrow way that I'm going to lay out. Sooner or later, they're going to diverge from what I lay out, the narrow way, you know, the, through the eye of the needle. Eventually, they're going to diverge from that. So that's the setup for the false prophets. Verse 15. Now we'll go to a metaphor verse 16 through 20. And the metaphor is the little blackberries and the book thorns uh, that can be mistaken for grapes and the flowers on certain thimbles that might deceive one into thinking, hey, the, the figs are going to grow here. But you, you don't get deceived for very long by these uh, uh, buckthorns and by these uh, flowers that uh, really are grown on thistles. Eventually, the truth about their nature will come out. Um, and it, and he's, he's saying it's going to be like that with people. Uh, one's fruit, not just what one does, it's what you start looking for. Anybody can say anything. They can train, they can go to Toastmasters, they can learn how to speak, and they can learn how to be in order. And they can say anything they want in a very convincing way. But he's setting, setting this up with this metaphor to say, start looking for what they produce. Don't just go by what they say. Look for what they <laughs> produce. And... Um, He's making the proposition that uh, however guarded and perfect one's words are, eventually they're going to do, they will betray themselves. If you look for the right things, they will betray themselves. So now we go to the third theme of these nine verses, and that's Matthew 7 21 through 23. 
And now he's shifting gears. It's, it's about uh, not just false prophets, but he's talking about false followers. Uh, they cry out, Lord, Lord, he says, to reflect their fervency. Now, it's, they're probably not saying, Lord, Lord, to try to say, well, you're our savior. Uh, I've been reading, I, I like historical fiction. I read uh, fiction only in bed. Everything else I do read doing this, not, but I read historical fiction. I'm reading one by uh, Cameron Compton. He's got a series and it's kind of about during the time of the Crusades and uh, uh, the English and the French and the time of the Knights and things like that. And everybody that's got their little fiefdom is called Lord. And they were, well, Lord William, well, they're not saying Savior William. It's just, it's a secular title. And that's probably what's going on here. They're not, they're not saying you're our Savior. They're just teacher. It's like saying teacher, teacher to them, not Savior, Savior. So, uh, so it, it, the use of the Lord towards Jesus as Savior really doesn't come later until almost the post-resurrection time because then people are convinced um, so Jesus is starting to say no no I'm more than a teacher I'm more than that uh, my focus is on kingdom activity and uh, in verse 22 through 23 he does something extraordinarily audacious he decrees who does or does not enter the kingdom uh, extraordinary then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, evildoers. He said, I, you know, I got your number. And you ain't making it until you transform. Uh, this is audacious at that time. I, I'm going to tell who's going into the kingdom. Uh, this is really extraordinary, I think. Uh, and he, he's supporting the truth that his claim is the authoritative revealer of his father's will. I mean, he's, he's now putting the pedal to the metal. Uh, so, and then in verse 22, you see the word the day. Well, that's the day of judgment. Uh, let's find that. Uh, Many will say to me on that day. That would be the day of judgment probably he's referring to. Um, now it's interesting during that time there seems to be evidence that uh, false claimants uh, have prophesied in Jesus name and it could be they did exercise demons and perform miracles uh, you know it looks like it's not counterfeit uh, but Jesus does something I think you know is just interesting he doesn't repudiate their claims he doesn't say your claims are false or anything like that he doesn't challenge their claims his challenge here is your claims even if you did them are insufficient even if you did cast out demons and heal that's not sufficient uh, doesn't quite cut it that's not what we're looking for so Jesus himself not only decides who enters the kingdom on the last day, but he's deciding who's going to be banished from his presence by that last one. Now, they don't quite accept it, but he is, he is the son of the father. It's God. And he's saying, I'm going to decide who is banished from my presence. And um, so... He never knew these false claimants shows how close, that, that he never knew these false claimants shows how close to spiritual reality one may come while knowing nothing of its fundamental reality. We could get very close to what could be the truth, but not get there just by what we do. Uh, there's more to come. I mean, if we're really accepted Jesus as our Savior, if we have really... Um, living like Jesus, there's more than just our acts. There's more than just what we say. Anybody can do that. 
So, so we've, we've set it up, there's false teachers, there's gonna be false teachers, and Jesus is saying, the false teachers are gonna be with you always, the false prophets are gonna be with you always. Um, learn how to discern who they are, learn how to challenge them, learn how to critique what they say, what they do, learn how to look for something beyond just what they say and what they do. There's more to the story. So, uh, what does good fruit look like? And that's the whole point Jesus makes throughout his ministry. Is it's not about what just what you say and do. It's about the good fruit you produce. Now, there's a lot of ways to look at how you evaluate good fruit. We could. If you ask 10 people to come up with the attributes of good fruit, you're going to get 10 different answers. Uh, but some of them will be common. But the key point, regardless of if you have three different lists of attributes of, of uh, good fruit, is that don't just use one attribute to evaluate whether uh, this person is really a, uh, a follower of Jesus. Uh, it, you know, it's like reading the Bible. You just don't take one verse and says that defines the theology of that issue. The entire Bible defines the theology of an issue. Just like it's not just one attribute that defines character. It's the totality of the attributes. So let's start with the fruit of character. Character. Character is what makes a person distinct. Um, particularly in moral qualities, but there's two types of character. There's a secular morality, and then there's Christian character. A little bit of overlap, but they're different. So how are they different? How does secular morality differ from Christian character? And I would, I would say that the difference is secular morality is actions that could very well be motivated by my love and what's good for me. I, mean, I feel good because I'm helping something. Look at me, you know. Um, Christian character is actions based on what's coming from the heart. What do you do when nobody's looking? Or is going to hear about it. So in Matthew 23, 27 through 28, uh, he writes, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. Wow. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Now, he's really hammering, hammering them. Uh, Christian character comes from a heart changed by the Holy Spirit. And that even goes back, of course, to the Old Testament, Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. And then on into Paul in Romans 5, 5. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. Now, we're at a point we can go back to where we started the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 1 through 16. We can circle back and bring that up. Matthew 5, 1, 16. The Beatitudes, be salt like light. That's Christian character. Um, now, I, I've got, over, over my uh, life, I have, uh, I've mentioned this before. I've personally known six people that I said, you're now my hero. Um, they're all different. One wasn't even in this country, but I've met them, I've worked with them, 
I said, you're my hero. Uh, you might not know it, but I've got you on my list because you showed me something I want a part of. And uh, they all had different strengths, different weaknesses, uh, different strong attributes. But there is a common thread I found in all of them, all my six heroes. Uh, the strength of true character that never deviated and never changed, no matter how hard the journey was. That strength was there, the core values, the core principles. I will not let go of what I believe in in Jesus. I don't care how hard it is. That was a common strength of all of them. Strong, strong people. Um, were they perfect? No. No, they had, they had their flaws, but they had something special about their character that never changed. It was rock solid. That's, that, to me, that was character. Um, and I, you know, I've, I've tried to uh, emulate a little bit of that character in these people I respect so much. So, character. The, the, the other fruit is the fruit of conduct. Now, the, the con, what's conduct? The manner in which we behave, our example. Uh, in Galatians 5, 22 through 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. Gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now that's an interesting last follow-up. Against such things there is no law. Uh, boy, that's an understatement. Wow. Um, Paul said the law was given to restrain evil. And here... He said, these qualities don't need to be restrained. The law is to restrain evil. I'm saying unleash yourselves on these qualities of conduct. Um, and there may also be a sense in which Paul is suggesting that the law cannot be against those who live in this manner because by being so led, they're in principle fulfilling all that the law requires. By uh, living out that conduct in Galatians 5.23 with all those, those attributes, they're living out the law. So um, the fruit of conduct is also demonstrated by the evidence of God in our lives. Uh, 1 Timothy 4.12, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for the believers in speech. Set an example in conduct. Set an example in conduct in love, in faith, and in purity. So conduct is an important attribute to look for as a fruit. Now, and of course this means when no one is watching. How many have heard of John Bunyan? Not, not Paul Bunyan, the, the lumberjack, <laughs> but John Bunyan. His brother. <laughs> well, now the question was, is John Bunyan Paul Bunyan's brother? Now, John Bunyan is such a stature in the, in the Christian bedrock. Yes, he was a giant just like Paul Bunyan was. John Bunyan wrote what many believe is the second most read book in history outside of the Bible. And it's called A Pilgrim's Progress. It was written in the mid-1600s. And uh, it's kind of written in the, um, like, like C.S. Lewis would write. He would take something and use fiction, you know, metaphors, analogies, and fiction to make a theological point. Well, John Bunyan does this in a man's giving up everything, even his family, to walk with God and, and find, find God at the end. And it, it's a, it's a, it's really fun the way he does that. Well, he wrote a book on, uh, actually it's about, he called it, it was called a booklet at the time about, well, eight and a half by 11 printed out today. It's about 50 pages and, and this is it. And uh, 
it comes out of the works of John Bunyan, volumes one through three. And that's bearing the fruits of true Christianity. Teaching husbands, wives, parents, children, masters, and servants how to walk as to please God. And I, I haven't had a chance to read all of it. I, I just came across it. I've started it. And it's it's uh, written in about the mid 1600s, so the language is that early English language, and uh, you have to kind of get through that. But it is. I'm going to read you what people say about this little booklet, and this isn't the one that's the most read in history outside of the Bible. Uh, it's a go-to manual for Christian conduct. Um, here's a, what a reviewer has said. Uh, this valuable practical treatise was first published as a pocket volume about the year 1674, soon after the author's final release from his long and dangerous imprisonment. It, it is evident from the concluding paragraph that he considered his liberty and even his life to be still in a very uncertain state, not from the infirmities of age, but for he was then in prime of life, but from the tyranny of the government and probably from the effects of his long incarceration in a damp, unhealthy jail. It is the best and most scriptural guide that has ever appeared to aid us in the performance of relative duties. Written with originality of thought and that peculiar and pious earnestness which so distinguishes all of Bunyan's works. No one can read this book without finding it in his own portrait truly and correctly drawn to the life. Many have been the hearers of the word in its public sermons, who have been astonished that a faithful minister has not only opened their outward conduct, and that's what we're looking at now, conduct but the inward recesses of their hearts and have inquired with wonder, where could he get such a knowledge of my heart? Have you ever been, you know, going to a sermon and say, uh, how, how did he know that about me? Why is he preaching focused on me? Have you ever had that happen? Yes. I mean, yeah, I like all the time. <laughs> where could he get such a knowledge of my heart? Uh, and I, uh, you know, if anybody would like a hard copy of it, uh, just let me know later. Uh, I'd be glad to make them. I'm, I'm starting to really enjoy it as I go through it. But it's about conduct. So the third is the, we're going to have to hurry up here, the fruit of teaching. Um, and then uh, Matthew 12, 33 through 37 talks about that. Uh, Make a tree good and its fruits will be good, or make a tree bad and its fruits will be bad, for a tree is recognized by its fruits. You brood of vipers, how can you, who are all evil, say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. Now this is on the fruit of teaching. For by your words you will be acquitted. Oh, not. I, I'm starting to get nervous about some of the things I'm doing up at Coyote Ridge. By every word I'm going to be acquitted. <laughs> and by your words you, you will be condemned. Oh, I'm starting to get a headache over this, right? Um, but I need to calm down and really take a uh, more thoughtful look at it. You know, I, I met a guy. Uh, he went, actually, he went into uh, Benton County Prison. And he was almost terrified. He, he was Bible study. He said, ah, and he quoted this, I'm going to be condemned if I say the wrong word. I'm just so nervous when I talk because, man, I, I think if I say I'm going to be condemned. And uh, you see what he was missing <laughs> was that uh, this isn't about making honest mistakes. I mean, we're not perfect. And it's about intentionally being deceitful in our teachings about Jesus Christ. There's a difference between, okay, I got it wrong, uh, versus I'm going to intentionally get it wrong because I want to deceive people. That's the issue. So, so I breathe a sigh of relief because I know, I know I don't intentionally try to deceive people, but I know... I don't always get it right, and I need to go 
do a little research and come back and say, hey guys, I kind of, let me share this other with you. Um, and then another, another thing that comes up in false teaching is uh, as learners, where do we spend our time? Uh, they spend our time studying a lot about false teachings and, or leave that up to the experts and study God's word. The Church of Latter-day Saints invoked the Bible and the Book of Mormons as their authority. The Christian scientists looked to the Bible and Mary Eddy Baker. Jehovah's Witnesses have their own version of the Bible, the story of Egypt. So do we spend our time going deep in all these things so we can counter, or do we spend our time speaking God, learning God's truth? Uh, the story is told in this resource I was using that a woman was uh, having lunch with a friend and talked about how her daughter uh, took a job at his bank and was being trained at this bank. In currency, in currency, what was that? Yeah, you know, and it's funny how they train her. Every day they bring her bills, one dollar, you know, whatever, uh, currency, U.S. currency. And they have her touch it and feel it and wad them up and unwad them and fold them and unfold them and rub them, fold them over and rub them together and kind of feel the outsides in there. Every day, getting her to understand that, that currency. And one day, they thought she was ready, they shoved in some counterfeit dollar bills or whatever it was, five or 10. And she started going through this stack of bills. They said, we want you to find the counterfeit. And she found exactly every one of them, no more, no less, just by touching them and feeling them. Now, they could have brought her in probably three, 400 examples of counterfeit bills and said, we want you to understand each of these. So learn all of these counterfeit bills and how they're done. But they did. They trained her on the one true currency and said, compare that to the others. So... I would suggest that in teaching and learning, uh, leave, the, uh, leave the instruction and the learning of the false religions in depth to others. Maybe know a little about it, but uh, yes, that's okay. I'm not suggesting you don't know how to counter some of these teachings, but do your deep dive in the truth. And then uh, the fruit of love. Uh, John 15, 10 through 12. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I've kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be com complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. So uh, love is the first fruit of the Spirit that uh, Paul mentions in Galatians 5.22, love. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. In other words, excel in these. There's no law against it. And, it, and then that brings us up, and we, we counter this a lot. Well, you must not love me, you judge me, Right? So let's spend a few minutes on that. Uh, Paul says we should correct our Christian brothers and says I should be corrected if I'm sinning. Uh, now, if you go to the dictionary and look up the word judge, it says form an opinion or conclusion. Primarily about legal decisions, orders, decrees, or sentences given by a judge or not. Form an opinion or conclusion. Well, how can somebody correct me of my sin if they don't form an opinion or conclusion about what I just did? Well, they can't. So let's say maybe that type of judging has a little G. And then you go to Strong's Concordance, and uh, it notes that the word translated judge in Matthew 7, 1 can also mean condemn. There's the key, I think. What Christ was saying was that as we're incapable of seeing a person's heart and knowing his or her relationship to God, we're not to take the place of God in making judgments about motives for eternal salvations. 
So judge little J can be, I think can be used when you're evaluating people. Uh, whether they're sinning or not, you know, you evaluate me if you see me sinning, you'd evaluate me and yeah, you're judging. You're, you're forming an opinion and let's call it little J. But uh, you're way above your pay grade if you judge me to condemn me. Uh, I'm above my pay grade if, if I judge people to condemn them and I make conclusions about their motives or ex at eternal salvations. I am completely out of where I should be. That's judging with a big J, capital J, maybe all cap letters, right? So uh, be humble, and this will come up, but well, if, if you love me, why are you judging me? Well, you know, bring some clarity to it, I, you know. So uh, let's, uh, let's move on, the fruit of relationship. This is interesting. Uh, John 14, 15 six, through 16 says, if you love me, keep my command, keep my commands. And I'll ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. Whoa. Relationship. Got that? He will give you an advocate to be with you forever. If he's with me forever, that's relationship, right? That's relationship. So uh, on relationships, the fruit of relationship, what does it look like? Well, John 15 tells us three relationships and this is part of uh, Jesus' farewell discourse. Discourse. Uh, Jesus dealt with three relationships that involved the disciples. Relationship with him. Relationship with one another. And the relationship with the world around them. Him, one another, the world around us. It's about relationships. Uh, the fruit of our life, the fruit of our life, Jesus wants to be relationships. Um, Jesus is the common point of our relationship with other followers of Jesus. Jesus is our common point. This is what we would call shared passion. Jesus and the relationship with Jesus, I think, is our shared passion. And uh, finally, the fruit of influence. Now, you might, well, I, I can't influence people. I'm not an orator. I'm not a teacher. I'm not a preacher. I haven't been trained in education. Uh, I'm not equipped to uh, do this or do that in front of others or whatever. And uh, there's so many ways to influence people outside of being a preacher, a teacher, an orator, or, you know, uh, bloviating, uh, or whatever. Um, our actions can influence. Now, earlier I said, don't just look at actions. I didn't say never look at actions. I said, don't just look at actions. Actions are part of that family of the fruit of character. That's one of the things we look for. Uh, actions can influence. Um, you know, you know after, it was a while after I started going into Coyote Ridge and I built up a very strong relationship with the lead pastor and uh, called him up. We went out to lunch up in Canal and uh, we had lunch and he said, you know, Bill, the class material you guys and what you're doing is really good. It, it's really good. It influences the men. But um, I don't think that's the biggest influence you have. In fact, I know it isn't from my experience. And it kind of surprised me. Well, why am I there then? <laughs> you know, if it's more about the material. He said, no. Um, Probably the biggest influence is not what you're saying, but the fact you're there, the fact you show you care. You can't even, you can't, I can't tell you what an influence that has on the men 
fact that you just show up, you could say very little, but the fact you're there, that influences me. Um, little things influence us. Um, I asked me, well, should I tell this story about my childhood? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know if it's relevant, but it must have influenced me because it happened when I believe I was in about the third grade, so I remember it. I remember, I can picture, I, I can form a visual picture of this event happening. And it did influence me, so I'll, I'll just share this example with you of how uh, little things can influence people. I've told you about this little podunk town we lived in, 50 people, middle of the wheat fields, uh, farming community. Many of the farmers probably didn't make it out of grade school. It was that kind of community. It, this was salt of the earth people. They weren't orders or teachers or preachers, uh, but boy, did they take care of the poor and the need. Or, or if a uh, farmer had his uh, all of his wheat crop ruined with hailstorm, they were there. They didn't talk about it. They didn't. But it's that. It's this podunk town, and there was the uh, Christian church, Radium Christian Church. We lived right across the street from it, and uh, there was a dirt road between us. You know. It, uh, barely a one-lane dirt road. It was just that kind of place. And our house was right across the street, and in those days, nobody locked doors. I, was, I think I was about in the third grade, and uh, worship service got over. I kind of bugged out. My parents, mom and dad, stayed around talking, and, you know, what, what, the third-year-old's going to stick around and listen to these adults talk? I don't think so. So I went outside, and... Uh, Others had gone out, and I don't know why I bring it up, but had this huge white propane tank by the side of the road, and this very elderly woman fell down right at the end of that white tank, and I remember seeing her fall, and others were there, and as it turns out, she broke her hip. Of course, she couldn't get up. A lot of pain, and it was cold that day, cold, and somebody said, oh, We've got, to, we've got to get something to warm. Put on her, get her warm. And um, I didn't even think twice. I, I, I ran into the house, burst in through the front door, went to my mom and dad's bedroom and grabbed her good bedspread and dragged it through the house, across the dirt road, across the yard, a little bit of mud and said, here, and I can picture this because it influenced me what happened next. Event, my mom, by the time I got about there, my mom and dad were coming out and trying to help. And this lady, my mom's name was Adeline. And this lady said, Adeline, I think Bill just drug your good bedspread through the mud. <laughs> and what, what she said next to me influenced me. She looked at that and said, Bill, you did, you did right. You did good. That's it. Nothing else was said about the money. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that influence, it, it taught me some things. Uh, what's really important? Don't worry about the little things. Take care of the, base, the immediate need. Everything will work out. Well, it did. I didn't get in trouble. For, I don't know. I don't remember whether I ruined it. But anyhow, I... You know, that influenced me. We influence people by just these little touches. You know, it doesn't take big things, folks, to influence them. Um, you know, one of my heroes influenced me by the uh, incredible courage. And I saw him put his career on the line to do what was right. And a big career. He was the general manager of the State Electricity Commission. He put his career on the line to do what was right. And... I said, I want a piece of that. Uh, that influenced me. Because I, well, this guy's tough. I'm not quite there yet. The little things can influence. The big things. And don't ever sell short how little things can influence. So, the bottom line, though, I think, in influence is, it's not about how much we blah, blah, or all that. It's about, did I do something to bring people closer to the God? And I think that's 
That's the uh, metric, the measurement of influence. Did we do something to bring them closer to God? So there's some uh, characteristics, six of them, to evaluate whether you've got a false prophet in front of you or somebody speaking the truth. Uh, and so, Is that person really bringing people closer to God uh, even when nobody's looking? Hmm. Um, so with that, you have uh, six questions for discussion. Again, I want to apologize to those of you on uh, Facebook that um, we weren't online. Uh, I didn't think about Ralph was on vacation and I should have got somebody to connect, but uh, uh, I'll take the hit on that one. But we're online now, I see by the comments and uh, I'm glad you're here, you know, and uh, Ralph will be back next week to uh, finish out uh, how to make a great decision. Uh, it should be a great topic. So let me close this in prayer and then you can go into your discussion groups. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for uh, revealing to us your ways, your methods, and your approaches that you can share with us and train us and teach us on, on how to bring people closer to God. Um, for, uh, that is the bottom line of uh, what you ask us to do, bring people closer to God and make disciples. And um, you show us and lead us and guide us on how to spot the charlatans and those that... Uh, are going down uh, rabbit holes intentionally to deflect from the truth. For whatever reason, whatever their motives, that's uh, between you and them, but uh, you show us ways that we can, we can evaluate and discern. And for that, we're truly grateful for giving us and uh, instilling that wisdom in us. Thank you very much, and in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everybody. Good happening.